friends, this is Peter Herbeck. I hope you're at peace in Christ. Uh, this video is a follow-up to uh, a, my previous video in which I talked about Dr. Joseph Pieper's book, Abuse of Language, Abuse of Power, and the relationship between truth and reality, and how critical it is in human communication, societies, politics, and the rest, to have those two realities connected together. Truth, objective truth, is connected to the ground of reality. Truth is the acknowledgement of the unveiling of, the, of what's, what's fundamentally real, right? So I won't go back to all of that, but it's an important foundation. And then I picked up something from uh, Cardinal Ratzinger, his book, The Yes of Jesus Christ, in which he analyzes the deeper spiritual battle that is uh, the temptation that's always there for human beings, but it really is now becoming dominant, at least in the Western world. That is the violation of the command to submit our mind and heart to God. Romans 1, you know, the wrath of God is coming against those who by uh, their wickedness, Paul puts his finger right on it, it's not, um, it's not a guiltless decision. It's a, res a decision we're responsible for in which we suppress the truth about God by refusing to acknowledge God and give him thanks. And then from that reality, comes a whole dimension of what you might call even God's judgments, the, the logic of denying the ground of truth that moves us into falsehood and darkness instead of the light of truth. Then we start living in that darkness, whether we call it our own radical autonomy or our own self-creation, but it leads us into slavery. There's only the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness, the kingdom of freedom, the kingdom of slavery. And you stand then by denying and suppressing the truth about God under uh, the darkness of the enemy and the kingdom of darkness and the will of men who are who are exercising their will of men and women uh, for control, for power. And then what ends up happening, instead of living in the fear of God, which is a healthy thing, the, the healthy filial fear of God, human beings then in the darkness become slaves and they become uh, trapped in the fear of men and the, the fear of the opinions of men, of those who dominate, those who control, those who influence because we lose sight of the fact that our life is in God and we can trust God and we don't have to worry ultimately about what works or doesn't work in this world. We can live in freedom knowing we're, our life is in the hands of a loving God who's all powerful and he has our future in his son, in his, ha in his hands, right? But when you step outside that, now the dominant and the dominant opinion of men begins to determine the source of my freedom. So I don't want to be canceled. I want to make sure I go along with whatever the dominant worldview is so that I can succeed and I can be free. And so there's just a lot to that. But that's kind of a, a summary of what I talked about in the previous video. But I'd like to kind of wrap up that thought because Cardinal Ratzinger takes it even a little bit further. He said the what ends up happening now is that the dominant voice becomes the media becomes uh, technology, and they project a story, right? And this is a story that is a world apart from God. That's what's happening. It wouldn't necessarily have to be that way, but that's the way it is because fallen people in a fallen world have become subject to it. And they don't see the spiritual battle, at least many don't, but they're in it nonetheless. So he described this, this deceit and this appearance instead of the real. He puts it this way, he said, the appearance of the world in the media is becoming more and more the real governance of the world. Fear of what appears becomes a universal power and damages courage of the truth, the courage to stand for the truth. Let me read that again. That's a critical thing to understand what's going on. I think the Kentanji Brown uh, ducking of a capacity to, to say what's completely obvious in her nomination, like, what is a woman? Here they are, ironically, I mentioned in the previous video, everyone's celebrating the fact that she's a woman, and particularly a black woman, who's being raised to this great opportunity in her life, and the country's celebrating it, and, and celebrating, again, her womanhood, but at the same time, she can't say what a woman is. That's part of the madness and craziness, and it should be an indicator, you know, a self-contradiction. But here's where he puts his finger on This is amazing. Fear of what appears becomes a universal power. Hmm. It appears I better align myself what, with what seems like the dominant opinion, or I'll get canceled, I'll get removed. That's human fear. That's not just um, 
being shrewd, ultimately it's failing to witness to the truth, which is the source of freedom and the responsibility of every human being, especially in political leadership and the rest, to stand and communicate the obvious truth of the order of things. Fear of what appears becomes a universal power and it damages courage to stand for the truth. Courage is the willingness to sustain a wound and standing for the good, the true, the beautiful. And so that, that fundamental Christian instinct and what we're all called to as human beings gets subjugated under a fear and it's subject to a darkened mind that no longer fears God, which is the beginning of wisdom. And then he describes it this way. He said, when the fear of God that has its proper place at the heart of the love of God no longer holds sway, people lose their standard. They lose their criterion. Fear of man exerts its domination over them, and there emerges an idolatry of what appears, and thus the door is wide open for every kind of folly. We lose the ground of reality. We lose our criterion. We broke from the standard of being, of reality, and of what's right and what's wrong. We lose the fear of God. That's how we got there. Not wanting to be subject to God. This is the human battle that's going on. We want to be God. We're going to save ourselves and fix the world and all that that's going on out there. But we know this. Um, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of man, which subjects it, uh, the fear of God to the fear of men, is folly. It's the opposite. It's foolishness. And that's the foolishness we saw writ large in that particular example I gave. But there's, they're all over the place. You know, people are calling a circle a square big everywhere. Businesses and Hollywood, a Wall Street, schools, you name it. Politicians are paralyzed and they're afraid because they're afraid of the opinions of men. They don't want to lose their political position. They don't want to lose their power, their influence, and their trap. This is an enormous test that the Lord is allowing to happen in people's lives. So he goes on. I, I thought about, you know, what scripture says, what many of the saints said. So um, human beings are no longer trusting God. They're trusting the opinions of men and that they're de as if their destiny is in the hands of men ultimately, and it's not. So the scripture is really clear. Cursed is the man who trusts in man. Cursed because he's walking in darkness. He's walking away from light and life. That's exactly what's going on. Uh, Cardinal Ratzinger continues, says, a society that turns what is specifically human into something purely private and defines itself in terms of a complete secularity, which moreover inevitably becomes a pseudo-religion and a new all-embracing system that enslaves people, this is what's emerging. It's a, it's a false religion. It's enslaving people. It's darkness. This kind of society will by its nature be sorrowful and filled with despair. You felt it, haven't you, over the last few years? Look at the rise of mental illness. Look at the rise of suicides. Look at the rise of, of hopelessness and despair that's coming. This is what happens when human beings turn from the true light, which is God, our only hope, right? And turns toward what? Toward the creature? who's lost, who can't, who can't deal with man's ultimate enemies, the world, the flesh, the devil, the powers of sin and death. Only Christ can do that. The truth. That's why he said, I'm the light of the world. I'm the way. I'm the truth that God the Father's offering for human beings in this exact position of slavery. It, it produces hopelessness. He goes on. He said this, this society that becomes uh, sorrowful, in a place of despair, he said it rests on the diminution of human dignity, right? Reducing human dignity, emptying human dignity. Where does that come from? It comes from God. Your life is infinitely valuable and so is mine because God made you. Because God holds you in being. Because God says you're good. Because God desires that you exist. Bottom line, that's the ground of all human security and human identity. 
That's what our Lord Jesus perfectly revealed to us. And he goes on to say, a society whose public order is consistently determined by agnosticism is not a society that has become free, which is the big lie, right? Break from this religious oppression, this narrowness, this judgmental stuff. Break from all that. It's all made up anyway. Our hope is in our knowledge, our technology, our power, our capacity to self-create. And oh, look at how free we are. It's a lie. Again, that kind of society uh, is not a society that has become free despite what it proclaims. But it's a society that has despaired. It is marked by sorrow of a man who is fleeing from God and is living in contradiction to himself. Living in contradiction to herself. And that's why that example the, 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 of, the, of uh, the Supreme Court nominee Kintanji Brown. I'm not just. I'm not picking her. I'm just saying she's caught up in this insanity. She's literally beginning to live as a contradiction to herself, celebrating and denying who she is at the same time. You know, a man is a woman at the same time, and a woman is a man at the same time. That's where we are, friends. That's the reality of walking in darkness. It's a sign that human beings are coming under a curse, under a bondage, into slavery. And there's only one way out of that. It's the light of Jesus Christ, and it's the Lord. And so I think one of the most interesting things that um, we can see in the Scripture is that the apostles understood this very clearly, and that they knew at times human beings, Christians, disciples of Jesus, the way to confront this is to live the faith radically, live it radically in faith, hope, and love. And our hope is in the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, and the life that he's given to us in the Holy Spirit, and he's given us a, a life of, you know, a destiny that's imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven. This is what faith gives us access to. Hope gives us great courage and confidence. You know, it, it's the foundation, really, of courage in so many ways, because I know my destiny. I know the hope that's set before me. I know who God is. I, I know myself in relationship to God, and it gives me a ground of reality, and it allows me to live in the light. And the Lord, of course, gives us the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit, who reveals to the human heart, to the hungry, humble human heart that seeks the truth, will find the truth. And the Holy Spirit will give us revelation and confidence in who Christ is and his promises, and he'll give us power to resist the darkness and to stand like the apostles. And so, the apostles talk about, you know, the gift of patience and patient endurance in this trial. The book of Revelation chapter 1, in that chapter, um, John, the one who writes the letter to the seven churches, was given a revelation uh, as he's praying for his communities who are being persecuted, they're under trial, um, a real battle is going on spiritually. And God's solution, the first part of the solution, is to give that leader a revelation of the glory and majesty of Jesus and the reminder that we're in the palm of his hand, the one who's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the one who alone holds the keys of death in Hades. He's the one who swallowed up death in victory. He's the one who's begun the new creation. It's in him. He's the unstoppable King and Lord, and he's the faithful witness to the truth about the Father. And so we belong to him as disciples, and we need to live in the light so we don't come become subject to that fear and slaves to fear so we can fulfill our destiny and our calling to be faithful witnesses. The servant's not greater than the master. We're faithful witnesses to the truth about God. A witness is a martyr. And it's the martyrs, of course, who are celebrated in the book of Revelation. And I think it's chapter 17 where there's their incense you know, their, their prayers are being heard because they they conquered the devil. They conquered the darkness. What? Through the blood of the Lamb that is receiving Jesus, having our sins forgiven, being brought into the life of the church, standing in the strength of Christ, right? They conquered the devil. has no claim over us anymore. We belong to Christ now. We've been baptized into him, and we're now sharing in his life the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. They conquered the devil by speaking the truth. They understood that every word that comes out of our mouth is good. We're going to be held accountable before God. And so, and they also understood that the healthy fear of God helped produce courage and hope. These things are all tied together. And the Spirit of God gave them patience. That is a capacity to not lose our mind, 
to pan not to panic, but to stand with poise. I love this description. Um, again, Joseph Pieper, the great philosopher, put it this way. He said, to be patient means to preserve cheerfulness and serenity of mind in spite of the inju injuries that result from the realization of the good. I mean, the martyrs, the early martyrs in particular, the stories, they converted in many cases those who actually put them to death because they died forgiving that person, loving their enemy, and they died joyfully. The joy of the Lord was their strength. And so they had a patience of mind. Remember uh, St. Thomas More, when he was dying, he was about to have his head, he was about to be decapitated. And his last words, he said, I die, you know, his majesty's good servant, but God's first. And then he had this beautiful word, I can't remember right now, to the man who was going to cut off his head, but he was, he had, he had poise in that moment. He had this description, he had, he had a certain cheerfulness in spite of the injuries he was going to endure, the ultimate injury of death, because he could do this because the Spirit of God was in him. He had love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. He had a patience and trust in God and the bigger picture. Darkness could not, the enemy could not get hold of him and cause him to apostatize and turn from God. And of course, the martyrs, as it says in the book of Revelation, not only conquered by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony, but they love not their lives even unto death. Thomas Moore and the great martyrs who are models, they didn't love their lives in such a way that they lost their life for eternity. A disordered love, a self-centered love. But they love God. They love their life in God. And they saw the larger picture and allowed them to be free and to be like Christ in that moment. Friends, that's what we've been given the gift of the Spirit for. That's what God's Word is meant to teach us. So in these seasons we walk through of Lent and celebration after, let's allow the Holy Spirit and the truth about who we are to lay hold of us so we can be the witnesses, the faithful witnesses we've been anointed by God to be and to win the victory over the fears that dominate this world and the darkness, and that we can walk in the freedom and the light of the sons and daughters of God. God bless you.